Hello and welcome to my tutorial series on Oxygen Not Included. Today we're going to cover how you should go about dealing with the two early game priorities that you have, which are providing oxygen to your duplicates and providing food to your duplicates. And I think we're going to start off with food because food is the, the one that has the, the, the sort of easy and correct answer. And the easy and correct answer for how you should be supplying food to your duplicates early on is mealwood. Mealwood is your ticket. Everything else is either a little bit more of a trap and not something you should be doing, or it's something that is more designed for the mid game and would take a little bit of a leap to get to in the early game. So what are the advantages of mealwood first off? Well, mealwood is a plant that has pretty easy conditions in terms of survivability. It requires a body temperature of 10 to 30 degrees, which is not hard because uh, your starting biome is around 20 degrees. Here we've heated it up a little bit. It's around 22 degrees, that's fine. We're still comfortably within that range. Uh, it requires air pressure of at least 150 grams. Typically speaking, we should have at least 1,000 grams of oxygen or something else around this area. So if we don't have that, then our duplicates probably have larger problems. It requires atmosphere of oxygen, polluted oxygen, or carbon dioxide. All these are things that you're going to have around your base. They're pretty much the only gases you're going to have around your base in the early game. So all these things are very easy to satisfy. And it only requires 10 kilograms of dirt per cycle to keep this thing growing. Um, it harvests in three cycles and produ produces 600 kilocalories. So if a duplicate needs 1,000 kilocalories per cycle, then just having five mealwood plants per duplicate is gonna be enough to feed uh, your colony. They aren't terribly labor intensive. They're very easy to supply. You have large quantities of dirt. Here I have 10.3 tons of dirt uh, ready to go with a lot more that I can dig out around the map, right? This stretch right here, this is a bunch of two ton tiles, right? There's, it, if each duplicate is only consume, consuming the equivalent of 50 kilograms of dirt per day, right, to grow the mealwood that they eat, um, then you're, you're gonna have dirt for quite a while. Certainly well into the mid game, you're gonna have enough dirt to supply all your mealwood plants. And so you have ready access to the stuff. Uh, it's very easy to grow. It, it uses things that you, you have in abundance. Um, it's probably the way you should be doing things in virtually every game that you play of Oxygen Not Included. In fact, a lot of people will continue using Mealwood well into the late game um, because the disadvantage of Mealwood is mainly just that uh, the meal lice have a quality of grizzly, which gives a minus one to morale. Duplicants, for whatever reason, don't like eating these wriggling lice that grow off a plant. Um, <laughs> But that isn't that big of a deal because uh, early on you don't have very significant morale requirements and those morale requirements are very easily met by things like the barracks, which provides plus one to morale, the latrine, which is plus one to morale, the mess hall, which is plus three to morale. We can upgrade the mess hall to a great hall, which will provide plus six to morale. Uh, we can upgrade the latrine into a washroom, which will provide plus two morale. Um, there's a lot of ways to provide morale early on that are gonna overcome a measly minus one that they get from having to eat something absolutely disgusting in order to survive. So mealwood is, is kind of the way to go. Um, plant five mealwood plants per duplicate and, and you're pretty much set. There are other options available and I want, want to kind of briefly explain why each of them are bad. I've built just for demonstration sake, a micro musher. Um, this is I think a trap that a lot of newer players fall into. They start either producing mush bars or lice loaf and the the thing is that these, neither of these are very resource efficient, and also neither of these t make good use of your duplicate's time, because you have to have someone operating this structure in order for it to produce things. It isn't that they just run up and they supply it, and then this thing starts generating stuff. They actually have to have someone operating this machine in order for it to work, um, which is a gigantic downside, and really the thing that cripples uh, all these. Mush bars, even if they didn't, required duplicate labor would be pretty bad. It's 75 kilograms of dirt and 75 kilograms of water to produce 800 kilocalories of mush bar, which has the same grisly quality as the meal lice. This is a lot in resources, right? When 30 kilograms of dirt can produce 600 kilocalories to spend 75 kilograms of dirt plus 75 kilograms of water on a mush bar, which also has some negative effects on your duplicates, um, for 800 kilocalories, this is just not worth it. This is something you do in an emergency. If for whatever reason you've just ran out of food, um, you can produce some mush bars, but outside of extreme emergencies, I think you should just be avoiding mush bars like the plague. Um, similarly, lice loaf, 
Lysolf aren't very good. They raise the quality of meal lice by one, so they're not getting a morale. You're not getting a morale buff from eating them, but you're not getting a morale sort of debuff from them. And also, they are generating calories for you. You're taking 1,200 kilocalories of meal lice and turning it into 1,700 kilocalories of lice loaf for the cost of 50, 50 kilograms of water. But a few things. One, water is a little bit scarce of a resource. You only really have the three pockets of it early on. And so you don't really want to be using it just to make some food. Uh, but also just, again, you have to have someone operating the machine. You're only gaining 500 calories out of this process. That's it's not a good use of your time, effectively. You'd rather just have them you know, deal with the, the lower quality meal lice, eat that and kind of just be content that they have some nice buildings to sit in, um, then spend the time to raise their quality from negative one to zero uh, in terms of their food. This just isn't worth it. it. It's not an efficient use of water. It, it's not an efficient, efficient use of time. I would avoid this for now. Um, you have some other options that are gonna pop up here as you uh, get more, get access to more different types of food stuff. Berry sludge is one that's shown up because um, I'm not sh exactly sure why, because I have bristle berries somewhere around here. We can talk about those later in sort of a mid-game guide. You're not gonna have access to sleep meat grains early on uh, and things of this sort, so let's just ignore that. Likewise, though, the electric grill. Um, here's a bunch of options that we don't really have access to. I can't make barbecue, really, or stuffed berries or pepper bread. The only one we can really make at this point is pickled meal. The main advantage of pickled meal is that it turns meal lice into something that's going to spoil uh, more slowly. It doesn't, it doesn't add any calories. It's still a terrible quality. It takes duplicate time and power to, to work. Um, just isn't really worth it when you can kind of stop all of the decay right here we have our meal lice at 100 percent fresh because we've kept our ration box in a sterile atmosphere it's surrounded by carbon dioxide um, this is why i suggested early on that you want to build a little food pit uh, at the start of your game just so it can accumulate carbon dioxide and have that just sit in the pit and keep your food nice and fresh Carbon dioxide is one of the gases that'll work with that. It's also one of the easier ones to do this with because it's the heaviest gas in the game, so it'll fall down. Any little pit will be able to capture it and keep it. Um, so pickled pickled meal lice, not also a good option. Most of these cooking options, again, just not good because they require duplicate labor. And that's something you're gonna wanna use to dig out and explore and research and do all the other stuff instead of just sitting around generating a little bit of extra food for your team. So. Mealwood, definitely the way to go. Cooking, definitely not the way to go. There are a few other options though that aren't bad, but they're more geared towards the mid game. There are more things that you're going to transition to. At the start, you're probably gonna stick with Mealwood uh, at least to some extent, and then maybe later on you switch to one of these things. One of the things you might switch to, for example, is Bristle Blossoms. Bristle Blossoms have a life cycle of six cycles, uh, relatively similar temperature requirements. Uh, roughly similar, you know, air pressure, atmosphere requirements, all that stuff. They consume water instead of dirt. They also consume twice as much uh, water as the mealwood consumes dirt. So uh, that's a little bit of a disadvantage. But on the plus side, bristle berries are less bad for duplicates to eat. Though they won't suffer the same morale debuffs. Uh, and water in the long, long run is a little bit more renewable of a resource than dirt is. Dirt is kind of actually hard to renew in the late, late game. In the early game, you have tons of dirt, but in the late game, blossom seeds might look a little bit better. The main kind of trick to, to blossom seeds, and there, I guess there are two of them. The first is that they require light. There has to be a light source. And if you want, you can set up some planter boxes or farm tiles uh, next to the printing pod, and the printing pod will provide the light for them. I think you can fit um, in this sort of setup, just a very straightforward, not doing any weird things. Uh, sort of setup, you can fit five of them roughly around this printing pod, and that can supplement your food production. Um, you also have access to some fairly easy light options. I don't think I've researched them, um, but you can research in research uh, lighting, interior decor. And with interior decor, you'll be able to provide ceiling lights or lamps to uh, light this stuff up. And that's not that big of a deal because these lights don't consume that much in the way of power. Um, I think the bigger deal is uh, one that they require water, which is going to be a little bit trickier of a resource to manage in the early game than dirt is. Um, and also, I have allergic duplicates in my base and the spores that trigger the allergic reactions are present in buddy buds, which are uh, a plant that you're going to encounter in other biomes. 
and they also are produced by fully grown uh, bristle blossoms. When the bristle blossom blooms, it releases uh, a set of, of germs, basically, that can infect, so to speak, allergic duplicants, and those allergic duplicants will have a negative, highly negative stress reaction uh, when encountering these, these germs. So if you have allergic duplicants in your base, bristle blossoms seem like a very poor idea in the early game. This base happened to take on some of these, so we're probably going to avoid bristle blossoms for quite a while. Uh, but they're they're an okay they're an okay plant to build, right? They they're they're fine. They're going to put a little bit of stress on your water supplies, but your water supplies are usually okay-ish in the early game. Um, this is more more of a mid-game plant, though, is what I would argue. I think this is a plant that you should be more transitioning to once you've found some more renewable water sources. Once you're kind of assured that you have the water to supply the oxygen that you're going to need for your base, then you consider bristle blossoms more as an alternative. Um, in addition, one of the things that you'll have access to relatively early on is ranching. We have hatches, which you can ranch over here. And if I go over here, there are some Drekos that we could kind of dig our way out and, and catch. There are a few tricks to this as well. Uh, one, hatching, uh, hatch ranching or Dreko ranching or even um, shine bug ranching. They take specific research to get to. You have to uh, go down the ranching pathway here. Uh, and for some of them, like the, uh, uh, the shine bugs, you're going to need something like a critter lure. But for Dreco and um, Hatch Ranching, this ranching, uh, ranching option will be enough. So you'll need to specifically research ranching, which is gonna take you some time. And then in addition to that, it's going to be uh, tricky to get food in the time scale that you need early on, right? Your duplicates have a pretty good supply of food starting out, but they don't really have an infinite supply of food, in, for food starting out. And it's gonna take a while to rev up your ranching operation. You're going to need to train somebody up to be a rancher, which is gonna be a little bit difficult. Uh, you need to build up the skill points in order to reach critter ranching over here. So someone's gonna to have to reach two skill points. Uh, here, Harold has been with us from the start. He's only just about, right? He's at 42,000 at a 50, or 4,200 at a 5,200 uh, uh, experience points. Once he reaches number two, then conceivably, if we had started him off on farming one, he could go to critter ranching after that. Um, but it would still be something like cycle 13, cycle 14 before you're really going to be able to get someone to ranch these things. And even once you start ranching them, it's going to take time to tame them. It's going to take time for them to breed and grow more of them. Um, they do drop a, a significant amount of food. If I killed this hat, hatch, for example, it would drop um, three days worth of food, roughly speaking, for a duplicate. So they're full of food. but. In terms of having a renewable supply that's going to come online fast enough for your, your starting base, probably not. You're probably gonna to need to do something like mealwood in the meantime, and the ranching, even though it's a very powerful thing because hatches also have the positive side effect of taking worthless rock and turning it into coal, which is gonna be an important fuel in the mid game. Uh, even though they, they do a lot of nice things and they're, they're full of food, uh, it's just not something you're gonna really be able to achieve in the early game unless you're a very, very aggressively foraging for other sources of food uh, as your sort of way of bridging the gap between um, your starting food resources and when you're able to get your, your ranches online. We'll talk about ranching more in later episodes, how to build ranches, how to set them up, um, sort of efficient ways of doing that. It is an option in the early game. I think it's just gonna be a, a big stretch to try and get there without doing something like mealwood first. So I, I, I rank them as more of a, a mid-game option. And that's pretty much it for your food options. Of course, you can uh, forage around the map and, and dig things out. We could, instead of going out here to nab these Drekos and ranch them, we could just go out here to kill them and eat them. Um, likewise, we could be digging up a lot more of these buried objects around here, finding more muck roots, finding more, you know, everything, more hatches to kill and eat. Um, that's not really a renewable source, but that is another thing to consider in the early game when you're kind of trying to stretch your initial food supplies. There is still a good amount of food around the map for you to go and get. One of your options is to just spend more time going and getting that food. So that's it for food options in the early game. And now I wanna talk about oxygen options. Uh, and there are really two big ones that you have to sort of debate between, and they are, the oxygen diffuser, which is very straightforward, works pretty well, nothing wrong with it at all. Um, it requires 
power to run, but power is a pretty simple thing to set up. It's only 120 watts, right? Instead of having, th th this manual generator provides 400 watts. So having a guy run on this is gonna be able to uh, run uh, basically three of these oxygen diffusers. And these oxygen diffusers produce quite a bit of oxygen. Uh, a duplicate only consumes 100 grams per second of oxygen. But just one of these will, will produce enough for five duplicates. It does burn through algae at a fairly uh, fairly quick rate, 550 grams per second. Uh, but it doesn't really have any downsides. It's fairly easy to set up. Once you have any sort of power system in place, uh, you can you can do this, and it isn't hard to set up these early game power systems. Again, it's just going to be a manual generator, a battery, and then some number of oxygen diffusers. Really easy thing to set up. Um, can't go wrong with an oxygen diffuser. I tend to go a different route though, and that is with the algae terrarium. Algae terrariums have a number of benefits. Uh, number one, they don't require any power, which can be kind of nice because your power options right now all take up duplicate time, which is something that's a little bit of a premium. Um, also, they're a more efficient use of the algae. Here we're consuming 30 grams of algae per second and we're getting 40 grams per second of oxygen. So we're going to need a lot more algae terrariums than we would need of oxygen diffusers, right? One oxygen diffuser is sufficient to provide five duplicates worth of oxygen, whereas an algae terrarium is going to require a lot more. But the big sort of secret advantage, and this is one of the important things that got changed about the algae terrarium uh, in, in recent times to make it a more viable option, is that it takes water and converts it into polluted water. And this doesn't seem like much of an advantage, but it actually is because in a sense, uh, this is allowing us to produce more oxygen. How do I explain that? Well, uh, if we go to say this polluted water right here, we have about 360 kilograms of polluted water sitting on the ground. This is because uh, these algatoriums use that water, converted it into polluted water, and then we had a duplicate run out here and empty it of that polluted water. Um, this polluted water is currently emitting polluted oxygen at a rate of 8.6 grams per second. The way I've set this up, all the, all the air that's being produced here is going to pass by these deodorizers. And these deodorizers take in polluted oxygen uh, and they filter it using sand and they turn it into oxygen. And they'll convert the sand into clay in the process. This has a large number of advantages. Um, one is that converting sand into clay is something that you usually want to do. Um, another is that it's effectively allowing us to electrolyze all of the water that we put into these algae terrariums, right? All of the water that we're putting in these algae terrariums is going to turn into polluted water. Once we're kind of done with these algae terrariums, we're gonna just remove them, put a, a row of deodorizers right on top of them. And as these bottles of polluted water emit polluted oxygen, um, we're going to have the deodorizers convert that into oxygen and slowly the all these polluted water bottles are going to convert themselves into clean oxygen for our duplicates. So we can kind of ramp up our production of oxygen in a really big way using this process. Um, we can basically, without having any sort of heat issues or, or any sort of dedicated buildings and, and apparatuses and power and everything like that, we can take a whole thing of water and just convert it into into uh, into oxygen, which is going to be very effective. And in the process, get clay, which is going to be turned into insulation uh, in the form of ceramic later on. Pretty good process. The main disadvantage of algae terrariums is, well, there, there's something first off that's a little bit of an advantage and a little bit of a disadvantage. The first sort of advantage slash disadvantage is that uh, unlike the oxygen diffuser, which will shut off if the air pressure is too high, the algae terrariums are always going to produce oxygen. And so this allows you to really highly pressurize uh, your oxygen producing room. And this is going to be something that, you know, if I unpause for a second, we can actually see the oxygen flowing out from this area into the rest of the base, right? This is kind of a pro and a con. The con is that as duplicates run in here, they're going to get pop eardrums and suffer a, a debuff to their to their morale, to their stress, basically. Um, not to their morale, but to their stress. Uh, and the morale will kind of offset that, that stress penalty. But um, it is something that also allows us to, to highly pressurize a lot of our sort of exploration tunnels, right? In a sense, it's an advantage because we can generate oxygen at really high pressures and force it into 
all the tunnels that we want to build to explore areas. Whereas with an oxygen diffuser, uh, by the time it reaches max pressure, far away from it, it's, things might still be at a lower pressure, right? We're going to see sort of this drop off here. We have things at around 5.5, uh, 5.5 kilograms, five kilograms, starts falling off, three kilograms, two and a half, as it gets down here, one and a half, down to one, and then we're gonna have some mixture of gases and whatnot over here, right? I have some carbon dioxide in here. These areas aren't really fully oxygenated because I just dug them out, uh, but that's sort of, you're gonna have a gradient, right? If the gradient starts off at a higher point, then it's gonna push that oxygen out sort of further in a sense, right? If I built a long ladder up into, you know, to explore, this, this system is going to be able to, using that pressure, push things out further. Um, the disadvantage, of course, again, is still those popped eardrums, but it's sort of an advantage slash disadvantage in that sense. Um, the other major disadvantage is that algae terrariums usually require more duplicate labor than an oxygen diffuser, right? The oxygen diffuser, you run up, you deliver the, the algae, you have some power system, and, and that's it. The system's very simple. You don't need to do anything more beyond that. Algae terrariums, on the other hand, you need to not just deliver algae, but you also need to deliver water, and then every once in a while, you're going to need to empty them to remove the polluted water, which is then gonna sit here. And of course, because we wanna convert any polluted oxygen given off by this polluted water into clean oxygen, we're going to have to have some deodorizers, and then people are going to periodically have to come by and replace the filtration material in these deodorizers so that they can continue filtering the air. So there's a whole chain of things the tip that I have for algae terrariums is that uh, they can absorb water from the floor that they are placed on. So you don't necessarily need to have duplicates shuttling a bunch of water from pitcher pumps over to your algae terrariums. You can do instead what I've done right here, which is that I basically I took one of the pockets of water that I had on the map and I dug my way in and let the water spill out into a large field of algae terrariums. And all these algae terrariums are on the verge of kind of finishing up their second batch of water. Um, we see some of them, they are, this one has a little bit of water left in it. It mainly just needs more algae in it and it's full of polluted water. 360 kilograms is its limit, so someone's gonna have to go by and, and empty it of the, the polluted water. They'll just drop it on the ground here. Um, but once these are kind of finished, once they've done their run of that water, what I'm basically going to do is just dig out this next level let another layer of water go across here. The algae terrariums will soak up that water and then turn it into oxygen and polluted water and the process will repeat itself. And I'll basically be able to take this entire block of water that I had here at the start of the game and just bit by bit convert it into these bottles of polluted water, which later on are gonna be providing a lot of oxygen for me because I'm gonna have deodorizers on top of them, right? So, this is an option. Um, I think it's a very powerful option. I, I like it a lot. Uh, I like it for, again, a number of reasons. It's basically a way to perform electrolysis of a very large water supply without having to deal with any of the heat issues early on. Um, it's a very efficient use of your algae because you're getting, for every three grams of algae you put in, you're getting four grams of oxygen out. Whereas for the oxygen diffuser, it's more, it's a little bit under one to one. Um, it's something that delays when I have to kind of put in a more efficient power system. Right now, everything is still just supplied off this manual generator and that works perfectly fine. I don't need, you know, to, to provide, have more duplicates running on wheels to get my oxygen up. Um, it, it's, it's fairly efficient, fairly effective. And I think with this little trick with the water, uh, it, it's something that you can do fairly easily. There is, again, this is another thing that's in the category of benefit slash disadvantage. Algae terrariums will also uh, consume carbon dioxide if carbon dioxide is exposed to them. They don't need carbon dioxide to work, but they will consume 333 milligrams of carbon dioxide per second if you put them in some area that has CO2. So I usually play where CO2 is a resource um, and I just store the CO2 for later delivering it to slicksters. Slicksters eat CO2 and turn it into oil. Uh, and so oil's a, a great thing. I want more oil. I usually just save up my CO2. Um, here I have basically all the CO2 just kind of pooling at the bottom of my base, right? I've kind of widened this, uh, this 
corridor, this stairwell, this whatever we want to call it, this sort of central axis of my base to allow the little things of CO2 that exist here to kind of follow their way down to, to this bottom area over here. Eventually I'll have some sort of storage solution for the CO2, um, but you could use, you could position your algae terrariums differently. If you didn't want to use the CO2, you could have taken basically the same structure and put it down here uh, and then maybe emptied this water thing into there bit by bit uh, to supply it with water. That is an option as well. So take that for what you will. Um, they will consume some amount of CO2. Basically three of these will consume all the CO2. Uh, actually, maybe it's six of them. Yeah, six of them will uh, consume all the CO2 produced by a duplicate. Uh, so you, you have that as an option. Keep that in mind. Uh, but I think that's it. I think I've covered pretty much everything um, for early game food and oxygen. The answer that I have is that mealwood is basically your go-to in the early game and it should sustain you well into the mid game. And uh, algae, either algae terrariums with some setup like this with, where you've combined them with deodorizers to get even more oxygen out of them or just straight up uh, oxygen diffusers are, are great options for producing your oxygen early in the game. Okay, that's it for this episode and uh, I'll cut things here and catch you guys next time.